okay okay so welcome everyone this is the second of our meeting our meeting and uh, today uh, we have the pleasure of having dr abhishek baskar So I will request Dr. Siddharth Yadav to give a brief uh, introduction uh, about Dr. Atul Baskar, and then we will start with the session. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Atul, for accepting it. And we started uh, the second, and uh, everybody knows Dr. Atul Baskar. And uh, take much time. Time. I think uh, we should start now. Huh? Okay, so uh, it is. Uh, is there some disturbance in the mic? Yeah, I think we'll request all the participants to mute their mic. Yeah, just mute their mics. Yeah. Okay. So my topic is basically on the foot. Uh, examination and i'll try and cover uh, some of the topics which commonly come in the exam so being an examiner of ms or then also for the uh, uh, the pediatric fellowship exam the commonest case cases which come in the ms are usually uh, a relapsed club foot uh, acquired flat foot which is commonly due to tibialis posterior dysfunction neuromuscular foot could be either uh, shakomari to or uh, uh, myelomeningocele polio still comes uh, really mainly the adult polio you don't see any children polio myelitis anymore alex valgus only there's one available and the exam really wants uh, to harass the candidate but infections trauma post traumatic deformities are extremely extremely common very rarely you'll get a dysplasia or a myelomeningocele or a amc after reposis in an exam so what i'll do is i'll just follow a common pattern of examination uh, of a foot so that uh, any child with presents with a foot deformity you are able to make a rough diagnosis from the history as well as from the exam in a newborn you will see a variety of deformities but all these may not be relevant as the child grows up except for cl club foot a vertical talus maybe hallux varus and tibial hemimelia hemimelia is always associated with the foot deformity there is equine varus deformity and hence whenever you get a child with a foot deformity you always examine the leg the the spine and the entire body so coming with the uh, basic history taking at the end of the history one should have some amount of idea when this deformity started and what was the progression and what treatment the child has taken so the onset is very very important so congenital problem will present immediately after birth a sudden developmental problem will present uh, during 5 to 7 years of age typically uh, muscle dystrophy and cp then during adolescence you will get the tarsal coalition you will get the shakomari too um, so it's very very important to know the onset of the disease and whether it's progressive or whether it's non progressive neuromuscular condition that typically progressive whether there is pain on uh, weight bearing because pain is a very important sign and pain is only present when there are fixed deformities or the rigid deformities and absence of pain is only seen in shakomari disease so when there is a shako foot you don't get any pain despite Uh, gross deformities shoe wear concerns is, is very important part of history so whether the child can wear a shoe whether he wears a splint whether footwear wearing is difficult because that has a lot of bearing on a treatment sometimes parents will seek advice just because the child cannot fit inside a normal shoe or the shoe wear is painful and of course family history so neuromuscular conditions club foot may also have a positive family history in about 1/4 of the cases so so it's worth having a, a, a good history especially with the onset progression and pain and that gives a lot of information about the tentative diagnosis so things like club foot will be present at birth myelomeningocele will always present with a scar but the deformity comes later on because foot deformity is usually present during age 2 to 3 years and sometimes with the very severe congenital deformities the child may present during adolescence with rigid deformity so is worth having uh, you know you performing a head to toe examination and a thorough uh, neurology examination is, is important as well and I'll, I'll touch upon that if you follow the apple system apple was always look feel and move so first part is always look and you start uh, you have an order in your mind whether you want to start with the fore foot or the hind foot and always follow a pattern so you can go from the front to the back of the foot you look at the footwear 
and then you after you do all the inspection you go for palpation you do the range of motion which i'll come to it uh, with specific joints again always do a motor as well as sensory examination again important for a uh, minor meningeal seal and neuromuscular foot where you should know the dermatomes where there is loss of sensation so the l4 l5 s1 and s2 dermatomes they basically supply from the medial to the lateral side of the foot look at the lower limb axis so you can see the child in weight bearing position whether there's any genuvalgum genuvalgum and whether the foot deformity is secondary to a lower limb malalignment problem uh, test uh, sorry special test i'll uh, come to that and also always examine the gait of the child so you have to look at the gait both in stance as well as the swing phase because certain muscles act in the swing phase and certain muscles act in the stance phase so this gives an exact uh, whole uh, idea how you examine the foot so start off with the inspection part and again you got two feet so always see whether it is unilateral or bilateral both uh, problem which are congenital and neuromuscular will affect both the feet if you have one side foot problem it is usually acquired very rarely you get congenital a problem but you must think of acquired deformities when they are unilateral problems so looking at the child uh, first look at the child in the non weight bearing position and then you make the child weight bear and you start with the forefoot to so look at whether the feet are pointing inwards the toes are pointing inwards or outwards look at the middle crease the arch look at the hind foot the heel position and the posterior crease always inspect the skin the tendon and the nails because that gives a clue about the diagnosis especially with rheumatoid arthritis a jra with the skin breakdown with myelomeningo seal neuropathic foot you have skin problems again you look at the callosities of the skin which I, i'll come to look at the bony contour of the foot whether it is in equinus whether it is in cavus whether it is in varus always compare the normal foot for size and shape so if there one side deformity only look at the size and the asymmetry because that will tell you whether the deformity is long standing whether there is any muscle wasting and then you make the child weight bear and then again you look at the child so look for any and also look for any operative scars so when you make this child weight bear you can look at the muscle bulk whether there is any atrophy you can look at the gait so there are certain patterns of gait which are seen in neuromuscular foot and then look at the callosities because that will tell you about abnormal weight bearing abnormal shoe wear uh, abnormal orthotic wear and whether there is any instability in walking so when the child walks suddenly his ankle gives way uh, this is very very commonly seen with tarsal coalition because the hind foot is stiff and they get recurrent ankle instability so when you look at the child typically of a club foot child you start with the four foot and you see the toes are pointing inwards uh, the, the mid foot there's a deep middle crease there is cavus there and then look at the hind foot where there is equinus and there is a deep posterior crease so you form a pattern where you start from the front and go towards the back and then come on the leg on the atrophy of the leg and the size of the foot similarly if you get a older child who's been under treatment don't forget the skin condition as well so you can see there's a, 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 a there's a there's a skin sore there because of a poor fitting of the splint you can see there's a abnormal bony contour here the lateral Taylor head is very very prominent. The toes are pointing inwards. Again, there's a uh, the midfoot is adducted, and the hind foot is equinus. And this probably is the commonest case you will get in the exam. Also, you examine the child from the back, so you can see the severity of the deformity. All of us should be aware of the Pirani score, uh, which I will not go into detail, but one should be aware of the Pirani score in case they ask you how severe is the club foot. In an older child, you will see the Uh, the typical deformity which is uh, in a relapsed club foot where the child presents with the lateral border of the foot is turned inwards indicating four foot uh, uh, intoing again look at the mid foot look at the crease and look at the hind foot so look at the foot in all the direction you can look at the foot from the from the top from the side and from the back and this will give you a fair amount of idea where where the callosities are But sometimes you may find callosities and trophic ulcers on the plantar aspect. This is very very common with myelomeningocele, where there are bony deformities causing uh, skin changes and trophic ulcers. So don't forget to look at the sole of the foot. And then on weight bearing position, you must look at the uh, the weight bearing stance. Look at the lateral border, 
in the medial border look at the tendon prominence look at the uh, look at the midfoot if there's any collapse and look at the great toe so you have must comment on the uh, on the attitude of the foot in standing so if this is pointing inwards so there is an intoing of the foot which may be because of the uh, foot deformity or maybe because of tibial deformity and you look at the lateral border then look at the hind foot and then any callosities you see so in inspection you must get a fair amount of idea whether this child this foot is rigid or, or flexible because if you see callosities you know that this foot is rigid there is some abnormal loading of the foot on weight bearing or with wearing footwear so you you got a fair amount of idea so when you get a foot like this you must mentally be prepared you know that this is a rigid foot and what other possibilities can be in terms of diagnosis similarly if you look at the plano valgoid foot this child is a mino meningocele child and you can see again from the forefoot the toes are pointing straight there's a callosity here there's a trophic ulcer because of shoe wear the midfoot is collapsed and the hind foot is in valgus and similarly from the top you can see the similar signs the forefoot the hallux is pointing downwards because of weakness there is a lack of uh, dorsiflexion of the great toe so these children when you look at the foot in weight bearing you will see the arch is collapsed and you must comment uh, this in the inspection as well and if you look at the arch of the foot typically a normal foot will have almost 50% of the arch of the foot is non weight bearing and with progressive uh, loss of arch you will find that the medial border becomes convex so you can actually grade the the arch of the foot from mild to severe and the most severe is when the uh, medial border is, is is convex and in the past we would do foot impressions so if you have one set deformity you do a foot impression and you can measure the length of the foot you can measure the weight of the foot and you can also see where the foot is weight bearing so this is a good way to you know if you want to impress the examiner that i would like to do a foot impression and further assess the uh, the deformity and the pressure the distribution of the foot again if you look at the uh, severe uh, flat foot you will find that the lateral border becomes concave so the lateral border here becomes concave which is here and that tells you that the foot is very very severely collapsed and this is very commonly seen in tibialis posterior dysfunction um, in plano valgoid foot because of cerebral palsy or in minor or in minor meningosy so this is it's important to remember Uh, the severity of the deformity when you see this kind of uh, pattern again don't forget to look at the the slippers or the shoes what the child wears and sometimes the parents will say um, that the child's foot is coming of the of the footwear and you can actually make out um, this is what we had de actually described when the heel is sitting within the counter of the slipper it looks well aligned this symmetrical when there's varus deformity you'll get more of the footwear seen on the outer side and if there's a valgus deformity like here you will find more footwear is seen on the inner side so just from the footwear on inspection you can tell whether what type of deformity this is and this is very important to assess at the time with the with the weight bearing position with the footwear on and you can see the delac contour as well and at this stage you can also describe whether there's any uh, genuvalgum or any genuvarum whether there is any uh, align mal alignment of the lower limbs also you can look at the crease on both the sides and you can see whether there's any shortening of the leg Uh, you can compare the popliteal crease so all that can be completed as part of the inspection inspection and that tells you how long standing the deformity is because these atrophy and shortening are only seen if the deformity is present for more than 2 to 3 years flat foot if you get a child with a flat foot you look at the if the arch is completely flat like this whether this is a normal flat foot when there is lot of baby fat or whether there is a vertical talus and i'll come to that how you differentiate but more common in the exam you will get is a flat foot which is a quiet flat foot a quiet flat foot flat foot is basically because of poor club foot treatment and this is a common presentation where you try and manipulate the uh, the quinus correction before the forefoot or the midfoot and then you break the foot in the center and you will when you do an x ray you find that the talus is still dying, the heel the calcaneus is still in equinus whereas the forefoot is in dorsiflexion so this is a common uh, case which comes in the exam is the acquired flat foot and that is uh, because of uh, poor club foot manipulation and it is also called a rock bottom deformity the only way you can assess it is by doing x rays because clinically it is not easy to assess the quinus of this foot another foot we see in practice is the uh, is the flexible flat foot 
And how do you tell this is flexible? Is uh, you come to the special test, but you also must see the child if they're wearing any orthosis. So you, if a child, uh, uh, besides the footwear, you must ask the parents whether the child is using any orthosis, and that tells your idea what has been recommended for treatment. And you will also base your your, your management based on what the child is currently using. So you must always inquire whether this child is wearing some kind of external splint. Flat foot, of course, is extremely common in practice, but what is important is the rigid flat foot, which is seen in about 9% of the cases which will come in the exam. So either a vertical talus or a tarsal coalition, and which accounts for almost 25% of the disability. So you won't get a flexible flat foot in the exam, but, but rigid flat foot is extremely common. And I've seen cases with the club with the uh, uh, maltreated club foot, the rocker bottom feet coming in the MS exam. I've also seen dip post dysfunction, which is of course seen in the adult. And in the CP child, you will get a plenum vulgar foot. Coming to palpation or the field part of uh, apple examination, so look, feel, and move. Uh, you know, for medical training, we've been taught to measure temperature and tenderness. Of course, in the foot, uh, this is important only for the neuromuscular foot. But the key thing is the flexibility, whether this is a flexible or a rigid foot. And you must have some mental picture about where the, the bones are located. So you must know where the uh, metatarsals are, where the navicular is. You must have a mental picture of the, of the, of the calcaneum and the talus so that you, when you palpate the foot, you know precisely what part of the foot is deformed and where is the main deformity. And then you come to the movement. So after palpation of temperature and tenderness, you look at the movement and you must record movements again uh, in the order of forefoot movements where you look at the toes, the midfoot where there is abduction and uh, adduction, and the hind foot where you look at the subtalar joint for inversion and eversion, and you look at ankle, uh, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. Of course, you look at the composite movement as well where you can uh, supinate the foot completely. So that is the combination of inversion and adduction and then whether you can pronate the foot. And these are important for neuromuscular cases where you have a, a peroneal uh, spastic flat foot where you have overactive uh, peroneal tendon and the lack of inversion. Or in case of tarsal coalition where there's stiffness of the subtalar joint. So you must have a mental picture of the range of movement and which movements are blocked and which, which part of the foot is more severely involved. Always inspect the toes. So the commonest deformity you get in practice is this uh, cavus foot with secondary toe deformity where there's hyperextension of the uh, MTB joint and flexion of the IP joint, what is called as hammer toe. So very rarely you get a single hammer toe. It is always in combination with the neuromuscular foot. Typically you'll see a cavus foot with, the, with this kind of typical uh, hyperflexed uh, foot. And this is commonly seen in neuromuscular conditions, namely Shakamari. Uh, or HSMN disease. One more tip to give you is always examine the hind foot by blocking the forefoot because sometimes when you look at the foot like this, you may think this is an equinus. But actually, the heel is neutral. It's only the forefoot is an equinus. Again, very, very common in the early cavus foot. So when you get a mild cavus, there's a drop only in the first ray and you may get only a mild equinus of the forefoot but not of the hind foot. So be careful when you inspect the uh, mild deformities where the where the deformity is located. We'll come to the uh, test for the flexibility. So there are some special tests which uh, have been described for the foot. What is called the uh, Jack's test. Of course, look at the foot progression angle when the child is walking. The tiptoe test, and I'll come to that. And don't forget, in a child who is different in walking is the Gavas test. I've seen uh, MS students fail because they didn't perform the Gavas test for a child who could not uh, get up or walk properly and this is a test you must know for any child who comes who has difficulty in walking or instability and as Dr. Kleneman would say always look at the shoes so if you look at the shoes of a child and you tell the exam I want to inspect see the child's footwear you know there you got you got extra points in the exam so foot flexibility to make sure whether the forefoot is flexible or not uh, if you just extend the great toe the arch, the, you should get a medial arch. And that tells you whether there is a tightness of the plantar fascia, what is called the Jack's toe raising test. So once you extend the great toe, you should get a medial arch. So if you don't get a medial arch, that means this is a rigid uh, arch, there is a arch collapse and there is a tightness of the, the arch muscles. Similarly, when you push on the 
on the uh, on the toes upwards what is called the clickhans push up test it tells you whether the deformity is flexible or rigid because uh, in kevas foot when you push on the metatarsal heads the toes will become straight and that tells you about tautness of the plantar fascia as well as the intrinsics and if it's a flexible flexible deformity you know commonly it can be braced or you can treat them with tendon transfers you don't need uh, interphalangeal fusion so that is why it's very important to assess the forefoot uh, and the midfoot laxity by doing these two tests what is called the jacks uh, toe raising test and also called the push up test and that tells you the uh, flexibility of the plantar fascia as well as the intrinsics similarly the tip toe test i mentioned earlier that when you have a severe flat foot the arch is completely collapsed but if you make this child stand on the toes you will find that the heel inverts and the arch reforms and this is a very very important test to assess hind foot flexibility so as soon as the child goes on the toes and because of the interlinking of the ligaments the hind foot will invert or go into varus and that tells you that the foot is flexible the hind foot is flexible that's the more important part and that the plantar fascia is flexible so you must know the implications of this test commonly if you have a tibialis posterior dysfunction the patient cannot perform this test because you cannot go on the toes in the absence of tibialis posterior uh, weakening of the tibialis posterior and you will find that the heel may not raise up to that level and the heel may stay in valgus so it's again important for any uh, medial side deformities any any deformities which involve the tendon of the uh, calf the tibialis posterior or the rigid plantar fascia no examining examination should be complete without doing a power assessment and a sensory assessment so you must examine the tibialis anterior the tibialis posterior on the medial side the perine longus and the brevis on the lateral side and the gastro soleus on the hind foot and then you come to the toe extensors and the flexors sensations again important mainly for the uh, uh, neuromuscular foot so you must perform these test and in case there is a neuromuscular foot you will, you will be asked to perform and i've seen uh, delegates you know failing when they can't examine tib uh, tibialis posterior this is probably the most important muscle they will ask in the exam exam to test both against gravity and the gravity eliminated and this is very important from the management point of view because if you have a viable tendon a good tendon for transfer that will be part of a management and hence it, it is important for you to assess the muscle power if you get a child with spastic foot like this walking on the toes very rarely you get a cp child in the exam because it's difficult to examine them but if you get a toe walking child you must again assess the muscle tone and what we have the test of ashworth's test where you do a rapid stretch which is called r1 and then you do a slow stretch to r2 and the difference between r1 and r2 tells you the spastic range or the flexible range so if you have a rapid stretch stopping at r1 and even if r2 stops here that means that there is contracture there is no spasticity so you must have some amount of idea whether this is a spastic foot or a contracted foot similarly this can be done for the knee as well but right now we will stick to the foot and this is only important when you get a spastic foot uh, if you get even a child with the early uh, duchenne muscle dystrophy you can check for contracture by doing a, a rapid test and see where the the, uh, the foot stops in relation to the uh, tibia tibia varus foot is a commonest deformity which will come in the exam and there are various causes the commonest uh, you will get is uh, uh, hsmn type 1 or 2 but don't forget to look at the spinal cord because there are cases with cord tumors or uh, with the spinal dystrophism you can get a kevas foot the usually unilateral unless it is part of uh, hsmn which is then become bilateral and when you get a child with kevas foot again you start with the forefoot midfoot and the hind foot so you can see that the foot is inverted there's a kevas of the midfoot and the hind foot is in varus but the key thing here in the in the kevas varus foot is in terms of management is to assess the hind foot and this is where uh, you know the examiner will always assess you and will test you how do you test for the hind foot flexibility so this foot is in varus so is it really in varus so this is a pseudo varus so this is the basis of the um, 
what is called the Coleman block test. So whenever you get a four foot pronation or a four foot drop, in order to weight bear, the lateral side of the foot also collapses downwards. And you can see what happened. When the lateral foot collapses, the heel goes in varus. And this is basically because what is called the tripod effect. You cannot walk on the ball of the toe. So, so to compensate, the lateral body will shift down and the heel which is looking neutral will shift into varus. And this is the basis of the Coleman block test. What is called the tripod effect of the foot. And you can test it in various ways. You can look at the, um, sorry. You have to know whether the forefoot var the varus is driven by the forefoot problem or whether there's a hind foot problem. So hind foot typically will be hind foot varus because of TA contracture or Dipalis posterior contracture. But in the forefoot, it is because of the collapse of the forefoot because the drop in forefoot. And you can either do a test where you keep the, the lateral body weight bearing there's no weight bearing on the middle side and you see the heel corrects into valgus. And here you see the heel is in varus because the forefoot is weight bearing. As soon as the forefoot goes, goes off weight bearing, the heel comes to neutral. So this is, this tells you that the hind foot is flexible. This is a forefoot driven varus, not a hind foot driven varus. And if there's a hind foot driven varus, there are only three causes, a TA contracture or a tipos contracture, very rarely a TA uh, table is anterior contracture. And you can do this test in various ways. You can do what was described by Coleman, where you get the forefoot of the of a block, or you can do it as uh, uh, described by Carroll. Sorry, um, where you take the foot of the uh, of a step or a stool, so that uh, sometimes you may not have a block available in the exam, so you may have a small platform. And similarly, if the forefoot is off weight bearing. You look at the foot from behind and make sure that the, the heel is in neutral or is in varus or valgus. Again, on look at the foot progression angle. So when the toes are pointing inwards, when the child walks, this is called in toeing gait. Typically, the foot point 15 degrees outwards. If you're pointing inwards, either it is because of the foot problem or because of tibial torsion. And that again, you have to assess the tibial torsion by assessing the biomedical axis between the malula and the, and the thigh. So thigh foot axis is important. Normally the foot is pointing 15 degrees outwards. So any intoing gait, any intoing position of the foot should tell you that the middle side is overactive, that the middle side there is a contracture or the tendons are tight on the middle side. And that tells you, uh, you can uh, do your management based on that. Lack of a hind foot inversion, again, like I told you about the tiptoe test. So this child, you can see when he stands, both the feet are in valgus. As he goes on the toes, the heel is still in valgus. There are only two conditions which will cause this in adolescent. One is muscle coalition or a stiff subtalar joint because of infection or tibialis posterior dysfunction. So if you have a heel in valgus with a tiptoe, Commonest condition in adolescent is a tarsal coalition, and it could be either a, a calcular navy coalition or it could be a subtalar coalition. Some other tests which will be which will uh, come in rare cases is, is uh, Alex Varus uh, deformity. When you push on the uh, on the great toe, you'll find the tautness of the abductor hallucis tendon, what is called as uh, the Lich blow test. Very rarely uh, you may get this uh, unless the examiner is a dairy orthopedic surgeon, but very Few cases come of hallux varus in the exam. It's a very, very rare condition. It is an isolated condition opposite of hallux valgus. And there's a tight band here on the middle side, and it is typically the abductor hallux tendon. <coughs> Again, this is a test which we had described uh, in a poster where you, if you make a child sit cross legged, typically you would find that to sit cross legged, the hind foot should invert. But if it doesn't invert, you will find the knee is higher on that side. And this is because, again, in adolescent, you will find that if there's a tarsal coalition, they can't invert the hind foot, which is similar to not inverting the, the hind foot on tiptoe. So here you see the knee on that side will be at a higher level. And this tells you that there is a foot problem with inversion. So you can make a child squat as well and see whether there is problem in squatting because of the foot deformity. So this will tell you that, uh, and the child will complain of pain as well and how the, the foot deformity can impact even the childhood sitting. So, you know, these are 
points which will give you uh, credit in the exam. So this is an example of what uh, Taylor calculated coalition on the middle facet. This is the commonest coalition you get, and here you can see there is narrowing, but there is no coalition, and you confirm this uh, with a CT scan. Of course, again, rare, some rare condition. Don't forget to look at the, uh, what is called congenital amputees. You know, look at constriction bands. Uh, this, if you get a case like this, this is a, what is called an amniotic band syndrome. It can be a spot diagnosis. Don't say this is a club foot. Say so this is a syndromic club foot because there is a, these uh, interpical bands which may be present elsewhere in the body as well. So they lead to auto amputation. You can get something like macrodactyly. Uh, again, localized gigantism, uh, again, part of uh, neurofibromatosis. So you must rule this out as well. So do a, look for cafe lay spots, look for spine. Um, sometimes you get like this helix varus. This child is uh, presented at around 12 years of age. You can see previous scar of surgery. So this can come as, a, come as an exam case. Don't say this is an untreated club foot because you look, the deformity localized only to this area. So this can mimic a club foot. This can mimic a, a metatarsal adductus, but you see the gap here between the great toe and the index toe. You don't see this in metatarsal adductus. This is only seen in helix varus. So these are some rare conditions which can come as a, as a spot case in the exam. Again, like I mentioned, don't forget to look at the leg. Sometimes the, uh, the genuine valgum may, may cause a flat foot. So malalignment of the lower limb, of the way the child is standing. If you look at the crouch position where the hip, knee is flexed, the hip is flexed, and the ankles and dorsiflexion. And here again, the gait becomes important. So when you look at the child's gait, whether this is a spastic gait, whether it's a high stepping gait, whether it's an equinus gait, so that's why the gait examination becomes important uh, for foot uh, examination. So in summary, when you analyze a foot deformity, you must know whether this is deformity unipillinar, whether it's equinus or dorsiflexion, whether it's biplanar, so whether we have with either varus or valgus or calcinus with varus or valgus. In the exam, the commonest deformity you get is equino varus. Very rarely you get equino valgus. Whether it's a triplanar deformity, so again, equino cavo varus is the descriptive term for a triplanar deformity. Very rarely you get a calcino cavo varus. This is very, very rare. So with a triplanar deformity, normally it's both equino cavus varus and adduction. So you must analyze the deformity in this way. You must see the zone which is affected, whether it is the hind foot, so ankle and subtalar, it's the midfoot, or forefoot or the toes. So you form a pattern in the mind, starting from the hind foot to the forefoot, or forefoot from the hind foot, and analyze each zone that is affected, because the treatment will be based on which zone of the foot is more affected and what you can offer. And lastly, whether it is fixed or flexible, whether it is spastic or contracted, whether the foot is braceable or unbraceable, look at the skin condition, and look at the proximal effects on the tibia and the knee. So uh, I think with that, uh, this is a summary of the foot disorders you will see in practice. This is the whole spectrum of uh, condition which we see, but uh, may not come as, uh, as a case, but may come as an X-ray. So colus disease comes as an X-ray, this is a nerve like it can cause a quite flat foot. Castle collision already mentioned, very rarely you get ankle instability because of OCD or retailers. So sports injuries and present like this. Severs disease won't come as an exam. Ankle instability, again, always think of tarsal coalition. Club foot is the commonest thing in the exam. So glabs club foot, you must know the Pirani classification. Vertical tailors again will come as an acquired uh, flat foot. Uh, normally, an uh, older child with, uh, with either will be treated or non-treated. Cavovarus, commonest is myelomeningocele, uh, shakomari, and polio in that order. So that completes uh, more or less the spectrum of uh, food dis disorders in the child. If anybody asks any questions, you know, I'm most, uh, more than happy to answer any questions if anybody has. Uh, so with that, I end my talk. If you want to send me any messages, you can always uh, you know, uh, take an advice on the phone or uh, on the email. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agnivesh and Dr. Siddhar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Atul. It was a very uh, extensive and very uh, nicely composed lecture.
so uh, if there are any questions then participants they can unmute themselves and introduce themselves and then ask the questions to dr atul baskar i just stop sharing the screen So I'm, I'm not sure how much of uh, pediatric food comes in the exam, but uh, you know, being an MS examiner, I've seen um, perhaps club food. Uh, you know, where there will be a lot of scars, uh, previous surgeries done, uh, they always come as an exam case. Mm -hmm. So uh, one question which I uh, want to ask you, Doctor Atul, is that uh, if uh, in exam. can you sort of uh, mentally categorize the children as per their age and their probable diagnosis like it's just the trick i'm asking you a trick that can you sort of have a general uh, that in uh, say till 5 or 6 years these are the most prese uh, the presenting uh, pathologies exam point of view you know typically you'll get a child who's going to cooperate in the exam so they will not give a child less than 2 years i've seen uh, children usually coming at 5 to 7 years so a child of 5 to 7 years it mostly most likely will be relapsed club foot if you presenting first time without any scars or sinuses you can get a short case which is a duchenne muscle dystrophy where you know i've seen delegates uh, fill in to do the gavas test and you know they uh, call it a spastic foot older child you get during 9 to 10 years of age will be typically a, a either a, a post infection or post trauma so commonest uh, trauma will be either a, A mid foot injury, which a child has occurred during, uh, you know, while playing, and got an acquired flat foot, or a child who's got infection in the mid foot, or osteomyelitis or TB, which will come in the in the mid in the less than ten years of age group. I've seen in adolescent uh, fungal infection, madurumycosis, presenting with sinuses. I've seen uh, tarsal collision come as a as a as a long case as well as a short case in the exam. And, and of course, uh, neuromuscular shakamari is a very very common condition, uh, which which comes in the exam. And I've seen kevo varus foot presenting. Uh, you know, almost in every MS exam I've been, I've seen a kevo varus foot. Either it's post polio, or it's post uh, HS men. Very rarely you get a you get a CP child if they go good cognitively. Cognitively, they will give you a CP child. But otherwise, uh, so broad spectrum would be a relapsed club foot. Uh, acquired flat foot, uh, infection, trauma, and neuromuscular in that order. If you ask me. All right. And uh, uh, what uh, sort of advice uh, you would like to give to the residents regarding the examination of spine in these cases? Since it's oh. might be so, let me ask this question to you. Well, commonly I find these uh, three or four points where students miss are they don't examine the gate. One thing is uh, they will finish the examination. They'll finish the palpation. And they'll say my diagnosis is this, and the examiner will only ask one question: Did you see the gate of the child? And they can forget the gate, and that gate may be because of a spinal dysfunction. You know, the child may have weakness; they may have shortening because of uh, they have a high stepage gate. They have, they have not examined, and then uh, the examiner will ask you: Did you strip the child? Did you see the back? And they'll find a small dimple in the in the in the, in the back, and you'll find uh, some uh, relation to spinal dysfunction. So. You know, you get a mild foot, and this is a trick thing. You know, they in a short case they will put us a foot deformity, but he may either have a cafe or a spot, or some uh, nevus in the back with the with the candidate forgets, and you know, examiner will say, okay, just see the foot, and what do you think? And uh, you know, a, a smart candidate, as soon as he sees the leg, he you knows the leg is it has got atrophy, the size looks smaller, it is one sided. Let me think of other causes as well. You know, so these things are, I would say, from the exam point of view, I've seen delegates miss those things. Other thing is they don't they don't see the plantar part of the foot. You know, they only see the foot from the front, the back, and the side, and they'll forget to look at the plantar aspect. And they'll you'll find a small trophic ulcer or a callosity, and you know the which is uh, which is indicative of a bony deformity. And and the exam said, did you not see the sole of the foot? And they completely missed it. So these are the because it's not a difficult case. The the, 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 the the everything is obvious to your naked eye, but it's the small points like you know not seeing the gate, the spine, the skin, the sinuses, where I've seen uh, delegates making blunders. You know, and you know they simply they lose marks uh, on a, on, a, on a good case. Right. 
and uh, uh, sort of uh, what X-rays or uh, can come in sort of pediatric X-rays or foot X-rays can come in say viva or uh, as a spot examination. So commonly, again, when you uh, when you get a spot examination, they will. I've seen um, you know severe disease. So in a, in a pediatric age group, they will always show in a, a normal X-ray, and they tell you the child got hind foot pain, and what do you think? And you know people will say this is a normal X-ray. Then they will show you a UBC, a cyst in the calcaneum. Again, which is an uncommon sight. And they'll say, what is the what is this X-ray? In a spot diagnosis, is colos disease. You know, when you had a, a avian of the navicular, again, is very, very common spot diagnosis. Uh, accessory navicular bone, again, is a very, very common spot diagnosis. Arcel coalition, very, very commonly missed as well. You know, people will, uh, will not see it. So they may have a fibrous coalition. They will have these uh, uh, beaking of the navicular and the talus. You know when there is a not full fledged coalition. Those kind of yeah, are important. Again, you must also there are special views. They sometimes the examiner may ask, "How do you take look at the hind view?" So you must know know what is called the Harris view. You must know what is called the axial view. You must take an internal oblique view to look at the subtalar joint. So there is some special views. They you know they, the person is doing well. They may ask you, how do you look at the hind foot? Because hind foot is not e easy to see on a lateral view. You must do an internal oblique view, or what is called the bowler's view as well. Look at the uh, the hind foot or the scapular joint. So these are X-rays which will be commonly asked in the in the exam and, and spot diagnosis is is accessory navicular tarsal coalition and I would say say Severs disease are the three most commonest congenital uh, problem they will ask. All right. Thank you so much. It was very exhaustive and it was excellent presentation. Over to you, Siddharth, sir. You know, new sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Atul Bhaskar. And it is always a pleasure. And we'll continue this. This is the second lecture in this uh, Ortho PG teaching program. And we will further take your time and advice. And thank you very much. And so it is well recorded and it will be there on the channel. So it will so be really very helpful for all the postgraduate and all the students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all the best. Have a safe day.